And I'm delighted to welcome you to a discussion on the role played by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, in support of economic development. We're very happy to have with us two eminent representatives of the agency, Kwaku Anning and uh, Jeffrey Shaw. Dr. Kwaku Anning is a Deputy Secretary General of the IAEA, Director General, I should say, sorry. And he's the head of the Department of Technical Cooperation of the agency. He was before Director of the uh, and Secretary of the Board of Governors and of the General Conference of the IAEA. Prior to that, Dr. Anning held uh, various positions in the United Nations systems. He was at the UN Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva, at the United Nations in New York, and in the field with the UN mission to Angola in the early 90s, where he coordinated the elections and humanitarian assistance. Dr. Anning also held the post of representative of the IAEA Director General to the UN in New York, and so we are delighted to welcome him back here. And it's a, also a great pleasure to welcome the current representative of the IAEA in New York, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Shaw, who will introduce the discussion in a few minutes. Before taking his current post in New York, Dr. Shaw served in various positions at the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and at the IAEA. In Australia, he was Assistant Secretary of the Safeguard and Non-Proliferation Office. He also served in Geneva as Deputy Permanent Representative to the Conference on Disarmament. Dr. Shaw is going to introduce the discussion. Then we will watch a short video on the activities of the IAEA related to water. Dr. Anning will then make a presentation on the work of the Agency on Development, and this will be followed by a question and answer uh, session. So, Jeffrey, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francois. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for turning up today in what's a, a truly awful day in New York after the last few days of sunny weather, spring-like weather. But I think uh, Kwaku and uh, his colleagues from Vienna have brought this across from Europe. Um, clearly, uh, it's a delight for the agency to be working with the International Peace Institute. The IP has a strong tradition in excellence in promoting partnerships to enhance global peace and security. And so we, this is our first collaboration with IPI, and I hope that it'll be a start of a fruitful partnership. The agency clearly is well known in the system as the UN nuclear watchdog. And our verification work is critical. It's critical to preventing the spread of nuclear weapons, and it's something that we're very proud of, the work that we're doing in the field. But that's not the focus of today's discussion. Now, some of you may be aware that in the last uh, hour or so, we've issued our latest report on Iran, but we will not be discussing that today and we will not be addressing any questions on Iran. We also have a very active program working with member states to enhance nuclear security, to protect facilities and protect materials from access by terrorists. Um, we work with countries to enhance their safety and when using nuclear technology. And the importance of this work in nuclear safety and nuclear security was highlighted last year, for example, at the General Assembly when the Secretary General convened a high-level meeting on safety and security. Um, for those countries that choose to use nuclear energy, um, we try to help them by helping them to ensure that it's used safely, securely, in a sustainable way, and it doesn't contribute to proliferation. But let me say, that for the most of our 152 member states, it's the application of nuclear technologies in areas such as healthcare and nutrition, food security, water resource management, environment, is the main driver for them joining the agency. We have technical cooperation projects in 130 countries, and these projects are developed in partnership, in partnership with member states to develop, to meet national develop, developmental priorities. In particular, we're looking at capacity building, whether it's in use of technology, but particularly in enhancing people skills. So today we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Anning with us to highlight some aspects with real examples of what we're doing on the ground and how we're making a difference on the ground in using this technology. 
We want to very much have an interactive discussion, so um, Dr. Anning will provide a, pr a brief presentation, uh, and then we want to have a really a free-flowing Q&A session. But before passing the floor to Dr. Anning, I, I, I know that one of the key issues, it comes up all the time in the MDG context and post-MDG environment. It comes up all the time in our discussion with member states, and that is the issue of water security. And I, I know that a lot of people are very surprised when I talk to them about the fact that the agency is working on water-related issues in member states to help them address this uh, sustainably, uh, water resource issues sustainably. And so we're going to start with a very brief uh, film. I think it goes for around about five minutes to highlight this particular aspect of our work. And then uh, Dr. Annie will come and address the floor. In closing, I'd point out that we have a number of publications uh, out near the, uh, the, the lift. So please, as you leave, grab a copy of the publications. My office is based here in New York, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. So I'll just pass over now for the film. Water can be plentiful or scarce, celebrated or feared. Too much water can lead to disease and destruction, too little to poverty and hunger. Reliable access to clean water determines the health of a nation, and it's vital for development. Without water, industries would grind to a halt, and agriculture would fail. But water is a limited resource, and one we use wastefully, over-exploit, and pollute. Agriculture, industry, mining, and power generation taint our freshwater sources. And most polluted freshwater flows into the oceans. Nuclear techniques play an essential role in understanding, managing, and protecting the Earth's water supplies. Isotopes are water's fingerprints and can be used to determine the origin, age, and renewal rate of water, and to locate safe drinking water. Every water molecule consists of two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. But all hydrogen or oxygen atoms are not the same. Some are lighter and some are heavier. These different atoms are called isotopes. When seawater evaporates, molecules with lighter isotopes rise faster. And when it rains, molecules with heavier isotopes fall down first. By measuring the differences in proportions between lighter and heavier isotopes, water's fingerprints, we can tell the exact history of water. In Bangladesh, arsenic pollution of the groundwater, the main source of drinking water for over 95% of the population, led to a major public health crisis. Isotope hydrology was used to determine the age of groundwater and find where arsenic's impact was greatest. This helped identify safe sources of drinking water. Agriculture is the largest global consumer of the world's freshwater supplies. But most of this water is used inefficiently Excessive crop watering can damage crops, pollute groundwater, and degrade the soil. When the land suffers, farm yields fall, hunger worsens, and development stalls. By using nuclear and isotopic techniques adapted by scientists at the IAEA's laboratories, farmers can save water and produce better crops. In a regional project involving 19 African countries, drip irrigation systems supported by nuclear technology are increasing water efficiency by 
leading to higher crop yields and improved soil fertility. Our oceans are home to countless species of marine life, a source of food and medicine, and a major generator of income for the fishing and tourism industries. But they're also a dumping ground for industrial, agricultural and human waste. The IAEA is using nuclear techniques to study, monitor and protect marine resources. In a dozen countries in the Caribbean, IAEA experts help scientists to use these technologies to study coastal pollution caused mainly by oil refineries. This project helps scientists in the region understand the causes of the problem and gives them the skills to manage marine pollution better in the future. As global demand for water grows stronger by the day, we must use all the available knowledge and tools to protect and preserve it. Governments have the know-how and skills to protect our water supplies and must act now to ensure that water continues to flow freely and freshly for generations to come. I would like to welcome everybody here. I'm very impressed by the number of people here with the kind of weather we have outside, cold, windy, miserable, but you've taken the time to come. You know, I work for the IEA and we are known as the UN nuclear watchdog. But the work we do uh, in verification is really not the only thing we do. In fact, it is almost 60% of the work we do has nothing to do with verification. They either go to, to assist development or to keep an eye on uh, issues like safety, nuclear safety, nuclear security to make sure that this technology is used in the most appropriate way. It is, it's also very interesting that we start, we start this with uh, this short film on water. Because we, for us, water is life. I would just like to give you a few little statistics to, to illustrate the importance of what the IEA does. On the globe, 97% of the water, and that includes everything, saline, um, water, seawater, fresh water, is in the sea. Or so in some kind of form, either lake, salt lakes, or, or seawater. So in other words, only 3% of what we, we have is fresh water. If we take that 3%, almost 69% of it will be found in the North Pole, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, or in the Alps, or Everest, or the mountains around the world, ice caps. If you take that out, 30% of the fresh water that is left is underground. As a matter of fact, only 0.3% will be found in the lakes and rivers and so on. So almost 100 times more water underground than we find on the surface of the earth. That brings us to the, the main technology that the movie, the little short film talked about, isotope hydrology. We use that to map out the extent of underground 
water resources. We determine how long the water has been there, whether it's fossil, fossil water or water that is replenished. Let me give you an example. There's a very serious drought in the Sahel region of Africa from uh, the west, Senegal, Mauritania, some parts of Morocco, Chad, uh, Niger, Burkina Faso, all the way to Ethiopia. But we know that they have a lot of underground water. We don't know the extent of the water. We don't know how long they've been there, whether this is fossil fuel, fossil water, excuse me. If it is fossil water, it means that it's, it's a limited resource. You can use it and it will disappear after a while. But in the same region, we have uh, the Chad, Lake Chad. We also have uh, the Niger River. So there are possibilities that there are catchment areas where some of these aquifers are being replenished. We are at the moment looking at a project involving these uh, countries in this region, 10 of them. The, it's also important to note that the water is not, you don't go from country X and there's uh, underground water separate from country Y. This cross boundary. And as you know, issues with water can sometimes lead to war because water is life. So we are getting together these 10 countries and to have a discussion because we would like to map out the water, train locals how to keep track on what is there, how it's being used, and how best to use the water. Another interesting statistic that I would like to bring to your attention is that 70% of this fresh water that we have, I just identified, is used for irrigation. But from that, 60% of the water used for irrigation washes off. It either goes, it evaporates, it goes into the aquifers, or flows into the ocean. So we're not using water as scarce as it is, we are not using it efficiently. But the worst part of it is, so are we not using fertilizers efficiently? So the water runoff sometimes are polluted with, with the fertilizers. And these end up either in the aquifers down or it flows into the ocean. The result of this, as was mentioned, is a lot of pollution. It encourages things like red tide, which is a rather very poisonous uh, growth that kills fish and any contaminated fish that human, a human being who eats will kill you. We have the technology to follow these things. We have been working with the governments of the Philippines and the Caribbean region to keep track on these facilities. This brings me to the ocean difficulties that we have uh, with ocean pollution and what we get, the resources that we get out of the, out of the seas. We have a lab in Monaco where we study, as was announced, we study and we follow pollution in the ocean. At the moment, one area we are looking at seriously is what we call ocean, ocean acidification. The ocean is a sink for carbon dioxide. So the more carbon dioxide you have out there, the more is going into the sea. And this is making the, acid, uh, the sea more acidic. It is killing off coral reefs, which means there's no way that little fish can hide from predators to grow to become the food that we eat. It is also very devastating for shellfish, crabs, lobsters, so we need to get a handle on it. And we are modeling to see the impact. We increase the amount of uh, carbon in the, in, in, in the ocean where we are, and then we check to see what impact is having. So we're doing a lot of work in this area.
from water, we go to food, food security. Here again, we have various uh, inputs to make. Again, we have a research, don't forget, IEA is a technical organization. But like everything else in life, politics is always part of it. But we do a lot of research into plant breeding using uh, isotope techniques. We manage to produce rice species that, that thrive in saline water. We have species of wheat, other things that can stay in, uh, in, uh, in flood water for a long time without losing its crop, the crop that we reap. As you know, recently in Thailand, after the devastating flood, they lost almost every, every uh, all the farms were inundated. And at the end of it, what you have is hunger, topsoil, disappears. Not only that, they lost a lot of their um, the animals that they, they were they railing for food, cattle, as well as birds. And sometimes these, th these animals migrate or as under the pressure of flooding, they move. And the chances of moving diseases from one place to another is enhanced. Things like food and mouth disease. We have techniques to follow these things. In fact, uh, vac vaccines for food and mouth disease, if we eradicate that, it, in case you accidentally spill this, it's not going to uh, um, infect anybody because we have taken out the venom. But, but it works very well, or the same, as a vaccine. In fact, recently we, we, we were requested by uh, Mongolia to help because uh, food and mouth disease is very, very infectious and it kills very fast. So we, we went there, we provided the vaccine, irradiated vaccine for them and it, they stopped the, the disease in its tracks and we set up labs for them to monitor and fed up um, to make sure that um, they don't recur. And then we organized uh, meetings with their neighbors, the Ru Russia and uh, China, to make sure that they keep track on, 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 this, on this problem, to make sure that we don't go from one country to the other with the same problem. Because if you, if you travel from here to there and you are not properly decontaminated, you'll be taking the disease from one place to the other. So we have a lot of, we do a lot of work on, on food issues. Not only uh, crop mutation, but also to keep track on animal uh, welfare. We also have a technique which we call SIT, sterile insect technique. And basically what we do, we do this in combination with what we call aerosol spray. You know, you spray basically to bring down the population of the pest once you get to a certain level, you breed the male species of whether it's a Mediterranean fruit fly, and then you release them in the field. They mate, but do not reproduce. And if you keep doing this, you can eliminate the problem. And we have some very interesting projects. In the Middle East, we have a project between Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. Here, politics is put aside. You cannot eliminate fruit fly in, in Israel and leave it in Jordan because they just come right back. So they have to work together. And they are working together with our help. We also, a few years ago, eliminated uh, Test fly from Zanzibar. Zanzibar is an island, and the sesa is a very uh, slow flying insect. It's very heavy, doesn't fly very far. So we're able to eliminate test fly. It infects cattle as well as people. 
we managed to eliminate the set fire from Zanzibar. At the moment, we are working in the Rift Valley in Ethiopia. Rift Valley, why? Because it's surrounded by mountains, and that the flies cannot go over the hills, the mountains. So we have a, a chance to eliminate it in Ethiopia. If you go to Latin America, Guatemala, Chile, this technology has proven vital for the economy that depended on fruit as an industry. Now, we are doing this work jointly with our partners, FAO particularly. We have a lab about 40 minutes drive from, from Vienna where we're doing this research. Brand breathing, uh, the SIT techniques. And once we, we prove something to be worthwhile, it's propagated through by FAO through their national network. So the seeds are propagated this way. And at the moment, in a place like um, Bangladesh, Vietnam, we have rice that grows in saline water. Because I've, in the beginning, I said that salt water is the, the largest water resource we have. So this is another area where we are excelling. The problem sometimes that we have is that we, uh, we don't have the main mandate in these places. Agriculture, everybody thinks of FAO. They will never think of the IEA. But we have eliminated rinder pests from the globe. And this wouldn't have been possible without the technology behind what FAO was doing in the field. We were doing the, the testing to make sure that as we move forward, we are making progress. So we, we supported this. In the end, the, the pest has been eliminated. So these are some of the things we do in food. Of course, we also f have food preservation. Food preservation using radio radioactive sources to, to, to get rid of potential um, pathogens that will rot food. I know that this is sometimes a controversial topic for some countries. And I was recently, about a year ago, I was in Indonesia, and I had a press encounter. And one of the press people came to me and said, you know, his brother has a mango farm, and he sells these mangoes. But he's been advised by the government that he should use irradiation techniques to extend the shelf life of his mangoes. But he says that people in, in his area anyway are afraid that this will be uh, contaminated, it's radiation, so they, they are not particularly interested. So what can he do? What can, what can he tell his potential clients? I said to him, have you ever been to a dentist? Have you had your a dental x-ray? He said yes. Do you know anybody who has been um, treated for cancer with radiation? He said yes. So I asked him, did you hug the person when they came out of the treatment? He said yes. Did you get radiation? Did, did the Gaga counter went off when you, he, they came out? He said no. So I said exactly this is what happens when you do irradiation. You kill any fungi, any kind of pathogen that is likely to rot the, the fruit. So instead of one week shelf life, you can extend it to two weeks, one month, or even longer. And most of you who work in the field know that post-harvest losses is the biggest problem we have in developing countries. The crops are seasonal, they come, we use them when they are there, then the season is over, the rest either rots, no, no canning, no, no silos to keep them fresh and safe. So again, here's a tool which is extremely powerful for the issue of food security. I would like to then move a bit and talk about human health. 
I just mentioned uh, cancer treatment with radiation. That is not the only one. The most powerful tool for diagnosing cancer is radiation technology. You can pinpoint the size, the location, and how it looks. And on the basis of that, doctors can operate or use radiation uh, treatment for it. It's not only uh, cancer. You can also use it for cardiovascular issues. It can tell you where there's a blockage, where there's inflammation in the heart, so some action can be taken. But for us, our biggest issue, and uh, by the way, I would like to mention is that in, in developing countries now, cancer has become a huge problem. People are living longer, their diets are changing, and chemo is 10 times more expensive than radiation treatment. So it's one of the easiest way of getting treatment using radiation. On, again, on, on, uh, on, on this issue, I talked about using it for heart um, diseases. But I would like to spend some time to talk about uh, nutrition as a health issue, especially in children. In the short movie, there was a description of heavy water that drops faster, and one is lighter, one is uh, uh, that uh, oxygen has oxygen 18, the other one has 16. You can give deuterium, which is a, um, a very stable isotope, to a mother. It's not dangerous, just like water, different type of water. It, it occurs naturally, but in small quantities. And then they feed the, 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 the child. Two weeks later, you just need a cotton swab, just like you do to determine DNA, and you test that. And from this, you can tell what sort of nutrition the child is getting. It is important for not only children, but these days, because of hunger, there's a lot of uh, problems with uh, malnutrition globally. So this tool, could be used very widely. There is this misconception that when you talk about nuclear technology, it's sophisticated, some, some machine sitting somewhere with shielding and all kinds. It isn't. Not what we use in the field. They are not. So we could use this to, to prolong and keep life, keep people healthy. And we had a, discuss, a meeting with the UNICEF yesterday, and hopefully we will be working together to see what we can do together on this. Nutrition is a big problem. So that is health, some of the things we do in health. By the way, we're also using the SIT techniques to look into the issue of malaria, whether we can, uh, mosquitoes could also be treated so they don't reproduce, not only in malaria, also in, for dengue fever. And there's research going on now in this area, also on, on health. And then, of course, the, one of the obvious things, like here again, in the case of health, we have a, a memorandum of understanding with WHO, because we, as the agency, we don't have the mandate. We have the technology, the knowledge, but not the mandates on health. So we have to work with WHO. So we are working with WHO on this. The next area, which obviously we have, uh, uh, the mandate is, is energy, nuclear energy. I know that after Fukushima, a lot of countries are nervous. But so, what, some of the things we do it to set the standards for safety, nuclear safety. And we working assiduously with member states. Now we, a few developing countries are looking into nuclear power. And we expect that this year, Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, United Arab Emirates, Turkey, Belarus, 
will start their, uh, building their first nuclear power plants. Behind them will be uh, probably Jordan, also probably uh, um, Saudi Arabia. And we have to work with them to develop the right infrastructure to make sure that the technology is used properly. We cannot build for them a nuclear power plant because that's a $2 billion undertaking. We don't have that kind of money. But we help train them on how to deal with safety issues, how to deal with security issues. We help them set up the infrastructure, legal framework, facilities dealing with safety, how to go about it. One crucial point is that when you have, um, in a country when one ministry or department or whatever is building is promoting nuclear power. The same department cannot be responsible for the regulatory regime for the power. It has to be totally separate. We provide a lot of uh, training, human resources for this kind of activity. The environment. I spoke a bit about the, what the work we do in the oceans to make sure that we, we keep track on what is happening there. Again, this technology basically it fingerprints anything that it touches. So you can tell what is in it, what is not there. So this technology is also very, very useful for research work on pollution, either environmental and otherwise. There is also a huge application on, on this environment. We also work with UNEP. The point I'm trying to make here is that we work with our part, partners, organizations, entities that have the mandates to do this work. And we use our technique to back them up to make sure that they succeed. Another area of work is, 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 is in industry especially countries that have, say, any kind of um, petroleum or fossil fuel industry. If you go to any of these plants, whether for um, refinery or for processing oil for exports or receiving oil from outside, there's myriads of pipes. And the best way to make sure that there, there is no potential failure in any of these, because if you have a, um, a pipe with gas running in it and it's suddenly in the best, the whole place is going to go up. This technology can tell where there are potential problems. Non-destructive testing. You don't have to cut it up. You just you run the equipment through it, and you, you see an image of it, and you can tell whether there is a potential problem or not. So you shut it down, and you fix it. This is not the only one. I spoke a bit about the floods in, uh, in, in, in Thailand, for example. This technology can also tell if you have a series of dams for flood control. You can, before you get the floods, you can use this technology to tell if there's a potential problem where the dam is going to fail. So there's a lot of things we do which is not in the public eye. And it's mostly behind the scenes, partly because the mandate belongs somewhere else. The difficulty we have also is that since we don't have the mandate, if somebody wants to give money to health, they go to the WHO, not to the agency. Or food and agriculture, they go to FAO. So we have been going around pressing, you know, spreading the word that we do a lot of stuff to support these uh, organizations that are our sister organizations. So they will succeed in what they do. So we also need funding. Show me the money. So anyway, these are a few of the things that we do. And I'm sure you, some of you have comments, you have questions. And um, my colleagues and I, we are ready to to deal with them. I thank you. And again, thanks everybody for coming. It's been very encouraging.
Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Anning. It's uh, extremely interesting to hear about how those uh, sophisticated uh, research and technologies are put in use for extremely practical purposes and, uh, and uh, for a, a huge impact. So thank you so much. I think it's extremely interesting. The, uh, I'm going to open up the, the floor for questions from our participants. I just will remind everybody that we are webcasting this discussion. And so if you could please introduce yourself briefly and speak in the, in the, in the microphone. And maybe I will start with uh, Saul. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Saul Weisletter. I'm the DPR of Costa Rica to the UN. Uh, Dr. Ranin, thank you very much for your presentation. I think you gave us, at least for me, a wealth of information of, about what you do. Uh, I have uh, some questions uh, which are uh, the following. With respect to water, um, how has it been the trend in terms of uh, efficiency in, uh, in, in water, uh, in, in, in applying your, your technolo the technologies to the water and to make it uh, more accessible and, and better for people, for all the needs? Uh, and um, since, let's, since I will assume uh, a certain trend, then my next question is, what can be done to make it more uh, efficient in the sense to accelerate the pace in which those technologies can be applied in the field? Because we're talking about the most important natural resource and essential for life. So one gets sometimes surprised that existing all those uh, technologies, how, can, how is it that, uh, that we still have problems that technology can solve and are not, have not been sol uh, solved? Now, in order not to take too much time, my last question would be, is related to that, but no. Um, are you happy with, or what do you do in terms of transfer of, of technology? How is it that you transfer the, the technologies that you that you develop? Those that can be transferred, I suppose that. Uh, and I'm not talking about I'm talking about technical assistance, um, but actual transfer of the technology. Because I know that in the area of uh, technical assistance, uh, we know a bit more. And uh, the last question now, yes, is uh, I think you mentioned that your main problem is that you don't have the mandate. I was a bit surprised about that. And then at the end, well, you're referring to a mandate in terms of funding, basically, or maybe something else, I don't know. We here at the UN, uh, whether the General Assembly or the committees, pass so many unsubstantial uh, resolutions that I don't see how can it be a problem to pass resolutions that can be so important. So. Uh, what, what is it the problem that uh, we haven't passed? Now, if it's a matter, of, as you mentioned at the end, of funding, I can tell you something. Uh, in, in any moment, but especially now, what would be different, difficult, I mean, is to pass a mandate increasing the funding without decreasing it some, somewhere else. Uh, so uh, I think there might be a big possibility and... Uh, not officially, but I, I can tell you that the mission of Costa Rica is ready to discuss with you and if there are uh, proposals for mandates in that respect, because uh, the work you do is very important and in order to help in that with other countries. But um, it, as far as it doesn't mean to increase the general budget of the organization, I mean the UN, because this, I think, in these days is very difficult. So this, uh, well, this is all I have to say. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I had said that, as you know, we seventy percent of fresh water is used for irrigation, and it's not, you know, efficiently used. And that portion that is used for irrigation, sixty percent of it is runoff. 
So we are working to develop system that will use water very efficiently. To give you an example, we have a project proposal. My colleague here from Morocco, he used to be with us, he's now here. For in Morocco, what we are doing is that we have um, a test farm and the neighboring farms. We know the soil moisture content of our test area. We have connect, we're trying to connect the farmers through mobile phones, because mobile phones are very, you know. And we follow the weather. We can advise them when to, 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 tend, uh, to, to irrigate, but use drip irrigation. In fact, we're even looking into mixing water with uh, fertilizer. So you do it at once. So this one area, if we can improve the way we use water for irrigation, 50% of our problems may be solved. So that's something we are doing. We got, with regard to the acceleration of field applications, see, we, what we do in the agency, and sometimes it becomes a, a misunderstanding with our uh, other UN colleagues, we do not have field presence. What we do is that in every country where we are, we have what we call national liaison officer. Somebody at a senior level, since our work is multi-sectoral, you say agriculture, health, environment, and so on. Somebody at a senior level who can coordinate the work at the country level. So we work through him or with him to develop the projects. And we work with him to implement the projects. This is transfer of know-how. And 60% of our budget is for training. We train a lot of people, and that's technology transfer. If a country wants to set up, say, a nuclear medicine facility, we first train them on safety issues before we do anything, make sure whether they have the necessary safety infrastructure in place to keep it safe, not only for the operator, also for uh, the patients, because somebody goes there to be cured, not to be killed. So safety is something we spend a lot of time on. This, again, transfer of the technology. We don't limit the transfer of the technologies only when it comes to very um, um, uh, areas where one could transfer the technology for military or other purposes. We don't support that. But as long as it is for any of these activities are just described, human health, agriculture, environment, water, we provide the technology. I mentioned that in the Sahel project that we have in mind, we are going to train the locals how to measure and maintain what we find and how to use it. If, if the, uh, the facility is not proliferation, we give full out to help to transfer the technology to the countries. Again, so this, this also answers your question. No, the mandate issue is that as the system is set up and we have individual agencies dealing with specific things. WHO for health, FO for agriculture. So it's not a good idea to say IEA should also be labeled as agriculture organization. So we work with the sister organizations, but which means that people don't know about the work because we are not at the front, we are behind pushing. So that is what I meant. That since we, we are not the one with the main mandate, okay, you are responsible for food, food security. Although our inputs are crucial, you tend to be overlooked. That is all I was saying. And regarding the funding increase, I mean, it's a struggle to get member states to give any additional resource for anything. But part of our problem is that because people don't know what we do. So my mission is I'm telling people what we do. So that if Costa Rica, and we're working with Costa Rica. And recently we have a, um, a pilot project we call iWave, where water user management, we are doing a pilot project which will be propagated. And Costa Rica is one of the countries we are doing this. You have to ask something? I'll just simply. 
when it comes to technology transfer, our, our budgets are quite limited. Um, and so it's not that we have an un endless bucket of money to be able to buy equipment to provide. But what we do work in, and something we've been exploring a bit, is public-private partnerships. And when it comes, for example, radiotherapy equipment, we've been able to work with companies in India, for example, to supply radiotherapy equipment to hospitals in Vietnam, where we go in, we train, as Kwaku was saying, to make sure they can use it safely for the operator and for the patient. So that's something we're, we're trying to do more of as well. Thank you both. We have one question in the back, and then we have two questions in the, in the front. We'll start perhaps with the back. And Thank you. Right. Hello, my name is uh, Alan Sackler from the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. And thank you very much for the very interesting expose. Um, <clears throat> I'm focusing on uh, the Great Lakes region of Africa, in particular Democratic Republic of Congo, and I was wondering whether your agency has any projects uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo or is anticipating being associated with some projects. Thank you. Yeah, we do, we do have projects in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In fact, probably DRC is one of our oldest members from Africa. I mean, not, that's the post-independent era after 57 onwards. Um, the Republic of Congo was the first, one of the first countries to join. In fact, even before it was a republic, it, under the Belgian, since we have what we call countries with source material, because the Republic of Congo has uh, uranium. Our board members, we have permanent members who, because of either their, their possession of the technology or the uh, country with source material. And Belgium was a member, permanent member of our board because of the Congo, because Congo had, and they were the colonial um, government. So we have a we have a lot of uh, projects in the Congo. Most of these areas, health, water, and and so on, food system. So we do have uh, work in Congo. Yes. Uh, um, in addition to what Kwaku was saying, we also help Congo with the area of nuclear security. We've worked a lot at the Kinshasa Research Reactor, trying to improve the physical protection of that facility, and we continue to work on illicit trafficking, for example, in that country as well. I, I think on that, uh, Congo is probably south of the Sahara, the first country that, uh, forget South Africa, the first country to build research reactor. At the moment, it's on mothballs. In other words, we're trying to see if we can decommission and get rid of it. But they were the f one of the first to do this. Microphone, please. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. If I maybe allow the follow-up question, what about the current uh, Inga Dam? Uh, Inga, the, the dam, the yeah. Inga Dam. Uh, in, in, in the yeah, the hydro, hydraulic, hydro, had, yeah. Well, we, we are not involved in that. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a, it's a hydro project. It's a large, huge hydro project. I mean, if the technology could be applicable, especially what I described, that's a way of testing whether the dam is Maybe as they progress, they may be using the technology, but not the locals, but the engineers from whether it's built by country X from the developers, are the ones who will be applying the technology. But we, as a matter of what we do with safety, we work with our, <clears throat> our member states to keep track on all the radioactive sources on their territory. So they would know, Congo, the government should know if they are bringing something to do this kind of work, they will know that there is such a source. So we have two questions in the front. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shaw, and uh, to the IPA. And uh, Dr. Anning, it's always a great pleasure to, to, to see you again. Um, I have uh, several questions, but I will limit myself to two only, since you are a good friend. He was and they a question. <laughs> and they will, be, they will be very easy ones. Uh, I will start from your last sentence, show me the money and ask you about funding of uh, technical cooperation programs and uh, whether you have sufficient uh, uh, financial resources and whether 
those resources available to you can allow you to have a long-term vision for technical cooperation. Um, my other question is related to technology transfer. Uh, I just wonder whether the, the agency have made or thought of making an assessment of the impact of technology transfer and whether there is an efficient technology, effective technology transfer to, to developing countries through technical cooperation program. I remember that the agency has made an, uh, a study uh, several years ago trying to trace those uh, people who have uh, benefited from uh, training uh, through a technical cooperation and see where they are now or whether they are still there, whether they are still training other peoples. So uh, I just wonder whether the agencies have something like that in mind for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on, the, on the technical cooperation fund, we, we really have problems. Um, when I first joined the agency, there was an attempt to increase funding for TC. And there was resistance to do that. And then at, at the, our board meeting, the government of Japan said that the most important thing is not the, the target that you, you raise, but how much of it actually comes in. Because the TC uh, fund is voluntary. Countries don't have to pay. They can pledge, even the pledge they don't pay. So we started working on this. And I think four years ago, we reached the peak of 96.7% of the target, almost 100%. But since then, it's been decreasing. So last year, we only managed 89%. As you know, the needs are increasing, not lessening. And when I went to Vienna, the agency had about 130 something members. Now it's 152. And there are about eight countries who have been admitted, who are waiting to de deposit their instruments of acceptance of the statute to Washington. So maybe by the end of the year, we may have four more, five more, six more. And all of these are developing countries. And most of these countries are members of the agency because of the benefits of the technology. If there's no reason, there's nothing to gain from this, they, are, they, they will not join. So it is important that TC succeeds. And funding is a critical problem. So one of the things I'm doing is trying to get, raise what we call extra budgetary resources to cover, as you know, what we call food no day projects. These are projects that have been approved by our board, but there's no money to fund it. So I'm raising resources for that. Now, the t um, technology transfer, I mean, like I said, we train a lot of people. And to me, that is also technology. We just don't send some expert to go and do something and, and leave. We work with the countries and nationals to do this work. Recently, we have come up with a mechanism to keep track on those that we train. And we call it in touch. It's a web-based uh, thing, and we keep all of these people in there. We uh, encourage them to contact each other and ask through this, so we know where they are. If they, when when they, they left us, they were here. Now they are over there. We want to know. So we we've been using this to keep track on where people are. And this was only uh, we started it last year. It's a new effort. You're asking whether we are trying to do this. Yes, we are trying to do this. Because they, and it's going to get worse, not better. Why? Because even those countries that have decided they, want, they don't want nuclear power anymore, I don't know, Germany, Switzerland, and others, what happens is once you say that, young people are not going to become nuclear engineers if they know there's no future. But even when you shut down your facility, you still have to decommission. It requires nuclear engineers. So the uh, possibility of the North poaching uh, uh, good people from the South is very rare. So that is one thing also we are looking at. Thank you. We have, uh, Beatrice, we have one question in the front, and maybe we take two questions at the Not, same time for yeah. the, okay. and another one, yes, Miko. And I think uh, Mr. Shevin. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, please. Good afternoon and thank you. I am a medical doctor and the country of my origin is Iran, but I'm not asking questions about Iran. <laughs> the, I have learned a lot of new um, things about your organization, although I've been closely following the organization for the last decade. The issue that I would like you to uh, comment on is the ocean pollution. The issue of plastics everywhere, especially in the developing countries, and plenty of it is getting into the ocean and is suffocating the marine life. Do you have training programs and educational programs for the countries to be aware of the hazards of plastic and the ocean pollution? Thank you. Here we have a second question. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Ubeda Rasul, and I'm an ex-UNer, but um, now work for a technical institute in Norway. And um, uh, my question really goes back to the last set of questions, because, uh, you know, it uh, when you go on the uh, IAEA page, the web page, then your, your attention is immediately drawn to your, you know, 60% of your activities. You know, you always go to the the very sexy and exciting news. But basically what you're telling us here is, and if we looked for this, we might find it, if we knew it was there, and if we really investigated it. And my question really relates to the issue of rebranding, because, um, you know, you're right. Countries, you know, what happened in Japan happened because certain countries are deciding to shut down their nuclear capacities. And there is a, a mood or a trend afoot that might signify that you know nuclear technology as such, or nuclear science rather, is at the ebb. But this is not true, and we know that a lot of the new medicine, new technologies are based on it. Would it therefore behoove you as an organization to look at yourselves and go through a rebranding and reinformational uh, process is that something that you are considering doing? I would imagine that it is, but I'm just confirming it because it, it, what we know to be IAEA and the majority for the last 40, 50 years is not this thing that you are now trying to tell us. And it would be good to put that rebranding issue on the picture. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, I think uh, the first question on the plastics issue. I mean, plastic is basically not. Uh, we we looking at things that have. Uh, nuclear technology component. You know, although we can uh, take samples from the ocean and test for what is there and what we could do about it. But when it comes to plastics per se, we don't have any uh, specific projects in this area. Uh, on the issue of, uh, we, we have just revised, rolled out a new website, so maybe you should visit us. Only only on Monday, was it Monday, that we rolled it out. So you might find it a bit more interesting. On, on rebranding, some people have suggested that we should take the word atomic from our name and call ourselves something else. We can't nuclear. do that. Nuc <laughs> uh, nuclear, I don't know. But yeah, what I am trying to do is, and our problem is, could be traced back to what people like to hear, especially in the North because they are more interested in verification, they are more interested in safety. And I'm talking CNN, BBC, and, and the others. So when I go to a country, I mentioned an encounter in Indonesia, I talk to the local press for people there to know what we're doing. But it's difficult for me to get on CNN because I not, nobody knows who the hell I am, so it's okay. <laughs> but. <laughs> But, you know, this is basically our problem. So we, we are looking right from the ground up to see what we can do to let people know what else we are doing. We cannot change our name. That is by uh, decision of uh, the founding fathers in 57. We cannot change that. So we are, we are trying to, by educating people on what we do. So that's the best thing we can do. And just, if I may, just to build on that, our Director General is fully, fully aware of this concern. And when he took up his position, 
he very deliberately had a strategy to try and get the message out that we're involved in much more than just verification. And so for the first year he was in office, he made cancer his number one priority, and he went around the world visiting many countries to talk about our efforts in trying to enhance cancer treatment in developing countries. The second year was water, and this year his focus is on food security. So again, we are trying, but as Kwaku was saying, it's not one of the sexy issues which is going to get hit the media. But we, we're conscious of it, and we are trying to improve. Thank you. We have, maybe we have three questions on the right, uh, Beatrice. The, um, Hello, thank you. William Verdone. Uh, Mr. Anning, maybe to get on international television so people would know who you are. <laughs> there is a product already that already exists. I think it's called Life Straw. Life Straw? Straw. Now, within the straw, there is a mechanism that takes away the pollution from whatever that straw is put into whatever water source. Now, if this were given out, wherever the funding might come, that will get you on television. <laughs> but the product does exist, life straw. Thank you, sir. OK. At least two more questions in the right. I think, uh, Beatrice, Beatrice, yeah, Beatrice, yeah. Beatrice, yeah, the gentleman yeah, on nice. your right. Patrizio Civili, I'm a former colleague of Quaco uh, and I'm now the representative of the International Development Law Organization here, the UN. First of all, I want to take issue with what Quaco uh, said, that no one knows me. I, for one, did not come here, as I told him, <laughs> because of passion for nuclear energy, but I came here to, because of Quaco's uh, name on the on the invitation because I wanted to see him again. Uh, two two <laughs> questions. One on uh, you mentioned uh, Quaco, the uh, what is happening in Western Europe and I guess elsewhere following the uh, uh, disaster in uh, mm -hmm. uh, that lack of uh, that uh, against that background. Does your assistant to uh, developing countries that want to uh, uh, initiate a program of uh, nuclear energy, does that pose uh, a moral uh, dilemma? I mean, we know that we know that much of the reaction in, in, in Western Europe has been emotional. Uh, much of it uh, uh, has some populist dimension. But behind some of it, there, there are some serious concern as to whether one can ever uh, assure completely uh, uh, the safety of nuclear energy. Uh, I assume there is also a difference between uh, advocacy work and responding and responding to uh, uh, technical assistance requests. Uh, but how do you handle that to the extent that it is a, a dilemma? Uh, the other question has to do with uh, the uh, mandate, the funding, uh, and so forth. Both Quark and I have a background in interagency affairs. Have you, uh, to what extent are you uh, uh, pursuing a joint funding uh, campaign with, with the agencies you work with? In other words, uh, uh, it uh, may not be easy for, for FAO to uh, uh, raise funds also for your component. Uh, you have indicated what are the difficulties uh, to do it as IEA uh, itself. To what extent are you, have you looked into joint fundraising campaigns with, with the agencies you're working with? Okay. Thank you. Th thank you, Patricia. Um, on, on the first question, <clears throat> of course, um, whenever I talk about this, I always use three words, safety, safety, safety. And we all know, we know, maybe now we know that the, we could have done something to prevent Fukushima. I mean, it could have been prevented. There, there may be a technology, technological solution to the problem. But I would like to say that there is no activity in life that has no downside. And nothing is foolproof. 
but with good uh, with good technology and the willingness to to do the right thing one can always find some common ground now these those countries that are now seeking this they are all taking lessons from what has happened in Fukushima if nothing at all what has happened has brought to the fore certain limitations that we have in what we do. So those countries I mentioned who are going to get involved in this, the most important things we do with them on build, is building the safety infrastructure, even before the, the, and we, every single thing that they do, one of the biggest uh, steps that you need to take is what we call siting, where you're going to place the facility. And this has become a key because of Fukushima. You cannot put something on the fault line or somewhere. And we, you know, when it comes to safety, it is completely, totally the responsibility of the member state. It's not, not outside, no outsider, the operator. Let's assume that GE built a facility for Ghana. It's not, GE cannot be charged with the responsibility of safety. Ghana has to make sure that GE is doing its right. So these are some of the things we are, we are taking. But again, these are, you say, also said, is a decision of the member states. And we do what we can, and we advise them. We give them um, what needs to be done. And don't forget, the technology is coming from somewhere. And that those guys are also at the forefront of this, and they are all aware of what is it. See, what happened in Fukushima, if it, if it happened in Ghana, for example, everybody say, developing countries, they don't know how to do it, don't give them anything. And the developing countries are very much aware that if they want to use this technology, safety is key. If you, safety is not there, nobody is going to sell you the technology, they don't have the technology. So that recognition is there, so that is also positive. Now, we've been working, I told you I met with UNICEF, and uh, we also met with, um, what is the fund? Um, MPT, yeah. We, are, we, we met with them yesterday, and we are, at the moment, whatever we do, we are looking at things, big projects that we can work with partners from our sister organizations. So this is something we're doing. Okay. So. Just to add one additional comment to what Kwaku has mentioned. Um, for example, the last year we've had over 60 countries, from, mainly from the developing world, have come to the agency saying we want to get into using nuclear energy. Now, a lot of the time it's not appropriate and we'll tell them that's the case. And what we do provide is energy modelling tools and train their technicians and scientists how to use them, and that's neutral technology. It's neutral. It doesn't advocate one technology over another. Um, but if they do then, decide they want to go down the nuclear path, we, as Kwaku said, will spend a lot of time on the safety side. Thank you, Beatrice. We have one question in the third row, and then we have two questions. I see hands in the back. Miko. Hello. Uh, my name is Kai Stabel. I'm with the United Nations Development Program. Uh, I also wanted to thank you for, for a very interesting talk, and, and, and going back to the branding issue, uh, trying to do this tweeting while you were talking, one ends up going to your new website, which is actually very good. And and having then gone from, uh, I don't know how many here have been in DC2, where IAE has an old sign, which reminds you of something that should be uh, hanging maybe in a canteen somewhere. <laughs> and, and I think, but this is a nice first step. I mean, already sitting here listening to you today, it ties in with some of the work that we're doing on looking at how to value ecosystems and other things. So there are definitely linkages. And I, I just want to say thank you, because I think this is definitely a, a good way to restart this sort of push right. to, to, to make it visible, the other aspect. And, and also now with youth employment being the big thing, we've also now tweeted a couple of people said that Nuclear engineers are in need, so, so for young people in look of jobs, yeah. they know what to study. This is the area to go. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Eddie Mandry with Global Kids. Thank you for a very compelling presentation. I'm originally from Kenya, and I'm painfully aware of the power outage problem. If yes. we were having this meeting there, we'd probably be in the dark. Um, so my question is about a um, regionalization and economies of scale. Is there uh, room for uh, you know, benefits 
to countries co collaborating uh, on nuclear energy. The costs are prohibitive. Uh, so what, what is there for Africa in the future on nuclear power? Then, maybe yeah. we take a uh, last question there. Okay. Yeah. Yes, um, uh, my name is Amr Al-Gwili from the Permanent Mission of Egypt. And it's, um, it's very good to listen to you and, um, on this very important topic. Two quick questions, uh, one related to the last um, thread that we were talking about. Um, when you mentioned that, um, I guess in this year, there's going to be five or six developing countries that will um, operate their um, nuclear energy for the first time and then two in the year uh, to follow, or at least in the mm -hmm. stage to fall. Many have been speaking of a nuclear renaissance in the last, um, in the last few years. Um, that was the, the, the buster, more or less. Then after Fukushima, um, quite a few European countries have declared that they will end their dependency on nuclear technology um, in, at a certain time. So in your view, um, will there be a nuclear renaissance or a nuclear decadence? You know, are we moving <laughs> away or, or moving into? The second question is, in, in your opening remarks, you spoke about, um, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I came a little bit late or so, but you spoke about a, a project in Africa regarding um, uh, using your techniques for water, uh, right. for water security. I'd, uh, I'd be very happy to learn more about this the exact countries that are participating in and whether that relates to the Nile Valley as well or not. Thank you. Well, we, we have completed uh, a project dealing with the Nile, Nile Valley and we work together with UNDP and other partners. So that is already there and some, we still have a few things to do on it, which is ongoing. Now, on, on the nuclear power side, your own country had expressed an interest in it. And in fact, you have already selected a site where you were going to, we, we hope in the future to, to set up the facility. And we know that there was some unf unfortunate uh, incident where some people went there and took away low, low level radiation stuff. So it, whether it's renaissance or decadence, I mean, I cannot say. But what I know is that among those countries, the so-called newcomers. A lot of them were discussing this openly and preparing for the future. But after Fukushima, there were all kinds of questions raised by at the country level. And they are still looking at the technology, but have not yet made up their minds whether they are going to go that way or not. But there are some countries that have no other choice. I mean, the choices are very limited. And I'm talking about, for example, Jordan. No energy, fossil fuel energy source. And you, as you know, they've been getting uh, gas from Egypt. And once in a while, it gets blown up, and then they are in the dark. And so they have to do something. So they are really uh, hooked. They, can't, they have to find something. And so there, we have such countries, and they may just have to do it more with more safety, maybe over design several certain elements to, to help them cope with any contingency that may arise. But some of them have very little choice. But I cannot say whether this is going to be for the future, whether it's going to be a trend or not. On the regional approach, when we advise countries that try to get into nuclear power, one of the things we remind them of is that first look at the grid. Some of the national grids are so in such a form that if you build one gigabyte uh, nuclear power plant, it cannot take the load. So you're spending two million, three million, three billion dollars building the facility, but you have to spend the same amount of money upgrading the grid. You know, and when you do it regionally, to me, it's better because you know. Um, if you, uh, if you go back to the East African community, when you have Tanzania, Uganda, and, um, and Kenya, you could get together and, and build something and distribute the power among the countries. In my own uh, West African state, I've always told my Ghanaian colleagues who, in the field that it's better to go regional, if possible. I mean, Nigeria has 150 plus million people Ghana, we are now about 22 million, and our neighbors, they are small countries, Togo, Benin, and so on. And at the moment, our great Ghana is connected to Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, no, sorry, uh, Burkina Faso, and Togo. So it's easy to build a 
system that will serve either sub-region or regional level. So that, that is something, but this, the decision is up to these countries. The, the program I talked about, about doing the water, it's cross boundaries. So we are getting the countries together to say, 10 of them, let's get together, let's exploit this uh, resource. But we have to agree how we are going to do it. There's always room for regional cooperation, absolutely. Thank you so much. Maybe um, we're going to conclude this discussion because, or we'll take one last question. Thanks a lot. Um, it's so late. I hesitated before I raised my hands, but um, I'm a former employee of the IAEA. I was I worked for the for the New York office. So the question I am going to ask is related to what Patricio uh, asked. It's about the cooperation among agencies in carry out, carrying out the uh, joint programs. Now, I know that there's close cooperation with the FAO, including a joint department. Mm, joint division, yeah. A jo joint division uh, in Vienna. What I would like to know is, uh, is there any uh, la uh, latest institutional mechanisms with the WHO, for example, yeah. and on funding with the um, uh, Bretton Woods institutions, with the UNDP. I just uh, uh, am posing this question about the latest uh, progress that has been uh, made in this area. Uh, the role of the agency has been low key here at headquarters, uh, but when you look at what happens in Vienna, the, um, the demand for membership by smaller countries in the agency uh, is quite high, so that there's a recognition of the value yeah. of the work of the agency, especially in the technical assistance area. Uh, so uh, just an update yeah. on the collaborative arrangements that are taking place. Yeah. Thank you. OK, uh, we, we do have a, a, an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with WHO. We're working with WHO, for example. We, we don't have a joint division like we do with FAO, but we have a memorandum of understanding. So we are cooperating with WHO in the cancer area, especially uh, non-communicable diseases, heart disease, uh, cardiovascular diseases, and also cancer. So there is something. Now, I, I'm here, to, I've met uh, several UNDP uh, representatives. I was here a year ago, and I did the same thing. I am trying to encourage UNDP to work with us. I mean, we, compared to UNDP, we are a small organization. I mean, they control billions of dollars, we don't. But if we did, you know, but we need to work with them. And we are trying, uh, the last time I was here, I met with the regional directors of Asia, Pacific, uh, Middle East, um, Africa, Latin America. This time around, Latin America and uh, the Arab, uh, the Middle East, and uh, we didn't meet with Africa the, uh, this time. But there is room for, for cooperation, absolutely. And, and so that is why I'm pushing. That's why I'm, I, I'm meeting with UNDP, UNICEF, and all these entities in, in New York to make sure that we, we, we cooperate, because we have a lot to offer to both uh, entities. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Kwaning.